Well, good morning and welcome to Worship Online at Altador Church this Sunday, February the 20th. Uh, it is World Day of Justice and we pray that um, we can all worship our fa God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit together in spirit and in truth. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kanai, Pekani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We also affirm our pledge to stand for justice and our commitment that our church is a place where all people, regardless of race, culture, sexuality, or faith, are welcome. Together we hope that all can find the true love of God and authentic community. Our call to worship from Psalm 86. There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Our first scripture this morning comes from Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah 42, starting at verse 1, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth in, in, with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place. And new things I declare, before they spring into being, I announce them to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have been working through over the last seven weeks a series of um, prayers from the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada, um, to which we are affiliated. And uh, we have learned um, a fair bit from the videos that they have sh shared with us. And then we pray together. So I invite you to listen to this final video now. As we orient ourselves to God and His Kingdom through praying the Lord's Prayer together, we pray with Jesus. He teaches us his way of prayer to shape how we see, think, and engage with others. Praying this prayer daily reminds us that we are to be participants in God's work in the world. The prayer reminds us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love and care for others as we care and love ourselves. The prayer, much like the Ten Commandments, encapsulates the stark realities humans face in life on earth in its present state. We pray for God's kingdom to be manifest in the world around us and that we may truly be salt and light revealing God's character to the world. We both focus on and love God in our prayers for His kingdom come and will be done on His earth and we pray for the justice, mercy and grace of that kingdom to be tangible for all peoples. Jesus, in teaching us how to pray, shifts our concerns towards the kingdom and away from our self-concern. As we pray this more increasingly, we find God meeting us in the prayer. 
Our own needs find rest as we pray for the needs of others. Our own hearts are transformed to view the world through God's kingdom lens. Our own agendas are reordered as we take up God's desire and will to restore humans to community relationships, both with God and with one another. Professors Stassen and Gushi, in their work Kingdom Ethics, write, The more we pray for God's kingdom to come, then the more clearly and compassionately we see the wrong, the injustice, the violence and the sadness in the world's patterns and power arrangements, and the more we become engaged in seeking our part along with others in correcting some of those wrongs. As our CBWC family of churches, our prayer is to increasingly orient ourselves towards God through continuing to pray this prayer both daily as individuals and weekly when we gather. We yearn to pray together, anticipating with expectation that God will reveal His will to us as we heed the call to humble ourselves, to pray, to repent of our sin, and allow Him to transform our hearts, minds, souls, and strengths to His ministry of reconciliation. May we be defined as the people who pray and practice Jesus' prayer. And so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, Make your name holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Together, Lord, teach us not to just pray this prayer, but to live this prayer out in our hearts and our minds and our strength. Let us, the church, be the people who shine the goodness of your character, your will for humanity into the places where darkness dwells and threatens to overcome us. In our hearts, in our words and deeds, in our self-righteousness and pride, in our unforgiveness and judging of others, in our power structures, in our pursuits of our own priorities, and in our trials and temptations. Let this be the prayer, Jesus' prayer. Teach us to love as you love. Together, may your kingdom come and your will be done in all the earth, in us and through us, as we join you in your work for the healing of the world. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Last year, our church was um, privileged to be a part of helping the Canadian Food Grains Bank around the world um, by supporting our local growing project in High River. And um, Can Canadian Food Grains Bank and Canadian Baptist Ministries, who partner together in this, have sent a short video of thank you for the way that we were able to support. Even though it was COVID and difficult, God used our gifts and offerings to help bless others. Let's listen. Hello from CBM and our global partners. We want to thank you for your generosity as a church, for engaging and taking on fundraising for the campaign of Grow Hope that is helping to feed the hungry. You know, in these challenging times in the world, people often of no fault of their own find themselves in difficult situations, especially around food security and simply feeding their families and themselves. It could be because of an explosion, famine, unrest or even economic struggles. They simply are unable to provide. 
you bring food to them. By being involved in fundraising for Grow Hope, you bring hope to those that are in need. We would ask that you continue to pray. Pray for many worldwide that have lost their incomes, their security around being able to feed their families. Pray that they would find work for the much needed security it brings into their lives. Pray for the pandemic and the impact it is having on them and that they would receive the much needed help. And then pray for the global church to find ways to make a difference and how they can help. And as well for the church in North America to find ways as well to make a difference and then to respond to the need. Bless you as a church and thank you for being a part of making a real difference in the world for those that are in need. Bless you and thank you. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 20 verses 1 through 16. A passage that none of us really um, appreciate a lot. Um, well, some of us, and some of us question it, but it is an important part of um, what we're going to be talking about today. So let's read Matthew chapter 20, uh, starting at one, verse 1, again from the New International Version. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them out into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages. Begin with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. When the others, so when the others came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered of them, or he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the last few weeks, we have been learning and been reminded of some of our Baptist roots. There is so much to learn. I do hope that you have taken advantage of some of the books and other materials available so that you can continue your own studies. And I also hope that you've had a chance to listen to the teaching from our Altador Informal three weeks ago. If you haven't listened to it or want to re-listen to it, please contact the church or office for the link to this wonderful teaching. A big thank you to Don and Marilyn and the Leadership Corps for all their work on this. And as usual, I am here to talk if you have questions along the way. Today, I want to tackle a fairly controversial topic, justice. It is the World Day for Social Justice. Baptists have a deep, deep roots when it comes to standing for justice. And we, in our own church, have often talked about justice. We, are refer we we reaffirm our commitment to stand for justice for all in our opening treaty announcement each Sunday. However, this is one of those places where we are not going to all agree. 
Dawn's comment a few weeks ago, 10 Baptists in a room and 12 opinions will be true here as it is in many places. Many of us will disagree some today. I do want to remind us all that we can agree to disagree on issues while remaining attitude with attitudes or sorry while maintaining attitudes of respect and love. I have chosen to use examples of justice from our Baptist history that are dear to my heart. There are many, many stories of justice that Baptists have been involved in around the world throughout history. And there is so much rich history as well as current issues that relate to justice. Dawn mentioned that some of our rich Canadian Baptist history, like Tommy Douglas and John Diefenbaker, who worshipped together on Sundays in the same Baptist church in Ottawa and then fought with each other in Parliament during the week. We are blessed by those kinds of examples. Disagreeing on issues, but respect and love for the person. I'm choosing some of the stories about justice from our Canadian Baptist history in Bolivia. You may, may be aware of the fact that Dennis and I served in Bolivia as CBM Global Field Staff for 10 years. We were there as uh, CBM and the Bolivian Baptist Union celebrated the centennial anniversary of our work there. A hundred years of God making a huge difference in the country and acknowledged by all levels of government throughout the nation. Most of the work centered around justice and the gospel preached through action. Word and deed together changing a people, changing a nation. And we were so blessed and privileged to be a small part of it all. I'm going to try and keep the stories short, but truthfully, I could talk about this for days. One of the earliest stories of Baptist standing for justice started in the mid-1930s when a group of missionaries bought uh, an hacienda, a large farm, um, in Watahata up on the shores of Lake Titicaca in the Altiplano. What they didn't know when they bought the farm was that it came with serfs, over 300 of them. And they knew that that was wrong. So they struggled with how to be fair and just to these serfs and came up with a plan that they would give a plot, a three acre plot of land to each uh, serf family. There were some things that they would have to do like construct a house and like plant on it for three years and then it would be deeded to them for free. Land reform. And when the government, uh, an, 10 years or so later, decided that serfs should be freed in the whole country, they adopted that land reform plan. And then on that farm, the indigenous people were educated, the Aymara were trained, and eventually rising to all levels of society and government. Many became Christians and many became pastors and many churches were planted. God's love and justice prevailed. But that last sentence, God's love and justice prevailed, is where the struggle with justice many of us come to. How can a loving God let hard things happen? I hear it often. Where is the justice in that? How can a God of love allow that? Where is God in all of this? The verses that we read in Matthew 20 really often hit home and we ask the same thing. How is that fair? How is that just? How many times do we say that or think that or it's just not fair and that is not justice. And see, that's the ju where the juxtaposition of all of this comes on a few fronts. Our definition of justice, particularly social justice, is usually quite different than God's. And the world's understanding of justice differs as well. God, who is God, is true to who he is, always. His attributes are always there. His love, always. He is just, always. He is omniscient, all-knowing, omnip omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, always. I could go on, but you get the picture. God is who God is. And he says, I am who I am, always. Just because we don't understand it or sometimes don't like it doesn't mean it changes. God is. 
always. So what is justice then? Well, according to the dictionary, it's both a noun and a verb. The noun is just behavior or treatment, a concern for justice, peace, and genuine respect for people, the quality of being fair and reasonable, the justice of his case, the administration of the law or authority in maintaining this, a tragic miscarriage of justice. The verb definition is the constant and perpetual disposition to render every person his due, to do justice, to see justice done, to summon one to justice. The problem with this definition is that who decides which is fair and reasonable or what is every person due? There are traditional opinions of this, but those seem to change over time. <clears throat> Some of you may remember the story and movie from the 70s called The Peace Child, where amongst tribes in Irian Jaya, one of the traits admired was treason. And because of that, the hero of, the, of Christ's story became Judas. It's a great story to revisit if you'd like to. But this is an example of how the definition of justice is not how we would think about justice. Views of justice differ, particularly social justice. And they differ depending on our upbringing and our society and our life experiences, etc. Nelson Mandela fought for political and ethnic justice. The Dalai Lama fights for Buddhist justice. Mother Teresa fought for economic and social justice. And you get the picture. We could go on. <clears throat> In our North American society, our legal system tells us that there are three kinds of justice. There's punitive justice. Let the punishment fit the crime. You did something wrong, so you must be punished. There's corrective justice, changing the behavior of the offender. And there's restorative justice. The offender makes it right with the offended. And we can all probably think of examples of each of these. <clears throat> it bothers us that in the Old Testament, God told people to um, pluck out their eye or cut off their hand. The punitive justice. To us, that seems unfair, not justice. And it often is. Yes, talking about justice is messy. We've often said the Bible is messy and so is justice. Of course, in our world today, there are the basic human rights established by the United Nations that are supposed to ensure some basic foundations of justice. But even these are often challenged, particularly when it comes to the marginalized, to women and others. Afghanistan and the right to education for women comes to mind. Some of these rights are the right to freedom of speech and the right to freedom of religion. In Bolivia, in 1948, Norman Dobbs, a Canadian Baptist missionary, and seven Bolivian pastors went to Milcomaya to spend the weekend preaching and teaching about God's love and justice and scripture, about God's salvation. Back in those days, it was illegal to do that. It was illegal to proselytize. It was illegal to preach. It was illegal to read scripture outside of a Catholic church. It was illegal to pray in public. Only Catholic priests could do all that. But they went anyway because of their desire for all people to know about God's salvation. And through a number of events, horrific things, Norman Dobbs and those seven pastors were murdered. They became martyrs. And it shook the country. These men stood for justice. The freedom of religion and freedom of speech were so important and salvation of God was so important that they lost their lives and in the process they changed a nation. Because of their death, the laws were changed and the nation embraced more human rights. In fact, most of them. It's still a work in progress, but God continues to restore his justice in this nation. 
And that's the fourth kind of justice. God's justice. Perfect justice. Very different than what some of us think. Easton's Bible Dictionary says, Justice of God is that perfection of his nature, whereby he is infinitely righteous in himself and in all he does. The righteousness of the divine nature exercised in his moral government. At first, God imposes righteous laws on his creature and executes them righteously. Justice is not an optional product of his will, but it an unchangeable principle of his very nature. He cannot, as being infinitely righteous, do otherwise than regard and hate sin as intrinsically hateful and deserving of punishment. He cannot deny himself. His essential and eternal righteousness immutably determines him to visit every sin as such with merited punishment. But God is also a God of love and made a way for the two, the justice and the love, to come together through Jesus Christ, his son, and his death on the cross, him conquering death, and providing salvation for all of us. It's all a bit tough to understand, isn't it? But it's a little bit more clear. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, he says, He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just as he. It's like I said earlier, God is God. Love and justice both. You see, he sees the bigger picture, the biggest picture. Our infinite small minds will never see it all. We have no clue what the future holds. We've sure been reminded of that. None of us would have dreamt what the future held three years ago and what we've lived through during the last two years. We don't see the future, but God does. And he has a deeper understanding than we ever will. He sees people's hearts and he understands each one of us in ways that we never will. God sees the greater good, the collective good. His justice is perfect in every way. His love is perfect in every way. And for God, it's all about community. We've talked about it. He lives in community. And we do as well. The family of God together. Yes, he loves each person unconditionally. But life happens in community. And the collective good of the community is important. It's we, us, not I, me. It's why we're meant to journey together with the people of God, the church, Christ's bride. It's why we are better together. Jesus died for you and for me and for all of creation. For all. Together, through him, love and justice prevail. God's justice is different than the social justice that we see today. Both important, but God's justice must prevail. I'm super concerned about our North American society today. It's so narcissistic and me focused, and that is not healthy. It's not God honoring way to live. We get so focused on what I want, what I need, what I want to hear, that we often neglect the needs of others. I clearly remember the anagram for joy that I learned in Sunday school. Jesus, others, you. Our world would be much better off if we kept our focus on that kind of joy. That kind of joy is justice and love and God honoring. That's what the prophecy that we just read in Isaiah 42 is talking about. Jesus, Jesus, God's chosen son, will bring justice for all nations. And he establishes God's perfect justice on earth, doesn't he? That's what it says. I will put my spirit on him, being Jesus, and will bring, he will bring justice to the nations. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. 
in his teaching, the islands will put their hope. And that is what we do, isn't it? God brings justice through Jesus Christ. As followers of Jesus Christ who long for justice, this week's memory verse needs to be our theme song. Hosea 12 verse 6 in the New International Version. But you must return to God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. God is about to do something new in our midst. We must stay close to him. Maintain love and justice and wait for our God always. This leads me to another story of Bolivian Baptist history of justice. The last one for today. One that we are privileged to be a part of, but I'll try to keep it short. In 1994, after a stint in Indonesia, Dennis and I and our family went to Bolivia to work in what we thought was a small program for children living in the jails with their incarcerated parents. We had no idea what it was going to become, but we quickly realized that there was all kinds of injustice happening in Bolivian jails. <clears throat> there was still debtor's prison. If someone owed you money and they didn't pay, you could throw them in jail. There was um, no human rights, no sanitation. Most of the women in the women's jail were illiterate and had been abused. There were no fair trials. There bribery amount abounded. It was awful. And slowly, as we began to work with the women in the jails and help their children, slowly, God's justice and God's love prevailed. When we first started working with the children, we realized none of them were registered in school, for instance a basic human right. But in Bolivia at that time, parents had to register their children for school each year. But if the parent is incarcerated, then the children can't go to school. And so we fought, went up the ladder of government officials till we found um, the wife of the vice president whose responsibility education was and got the right for the children to be registered in school by someone other than their parent. We fought for health measures, doctors and um, um, dentists, etc. We fought for sanitation, for running water, for basic human rights. And not long after we were there, things like debtor's prison were abolished. Lots of issues, lots of things. And children and injustice always tug at our heartstrings. And yet, God was and is at work, and God's love and justice rose up and prevailed. I could tell you hundreds of stories of all the ways that God's perfect justice is at work, even today, but I will refrain. But it is an example, because that was not very long ago, not even 30 years ago, and it is an ongoing work. And there is still so much work to be done when it comes to justice. In countries like Bolivia and all around the world, and in our own country too, justice must prevail. We've seen it, and we continue to see it. Residential schools, murdered and, min murdered and missing Indigenous women issues, Black and Asian discrimination, persecution of the marginalized, like those in the LGBTQ community, etc., Civil war in Myanmar or Burma, Syria, Afghanistan, um, Sudan, I could go on. Issues like slavery and sex trade and corruption, and that list goes on. There is a lot to be done when it comes to God's justice. And our verses in Isaiah 42 again, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. Are you hearing that? I, the Lord, have called you and the collective you, us, in righteousness. 
I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. That is what World Day of Justice should be all about. Our triune God will take our hand and will lead us forward as a light to all so that Jesus, our Savior, together we can bring justice for all to this world. Amen. Our benediction. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing. Go forth, remembering who you are and to whom you belong. And the triune God goes with all of us each day. Amen.